We're going to get rolling with session number two. Melissa and I are going to do this session together, and then we are going to take a little short break, and then Dr. Greg is going to come up and do his session, and then we'll take a short break, and then Johannes and Maria, their session, short break, and then finish out with question and answer. So I want you guys to know that during the first session, if you have any questions, it doesn't have to be pertaining to the sessions. It could be pertaining to anything to do with the relationship. If you could write those down. And then there's going to be ushers standing. Is there ushers standing at the door, Daniel? Yes, sir. Yeah, with baskets that you could just drop those questions. You got a little three-by-five card when you came in. You could just write your question on that and then drop it in that basket. And then I'm going to actually be going over those during session two so that we can answer them after session three is over. So we left off last night. I'm just going to do a quick recap. But we left off last night talking about the mystery of marriage and how it is really a true miracle of God, just like a salvation to a soul, a, a child being birthed through a mother. There's so many things that God has done within humanity and within our, our lives that are just truly a miracle. And the scripture says that it's a real mystery, and it says that like in Genesis 2, 24, the man leaves his father and his mother and is joined together with his wife. The two are united into one, and that is what it says is a great mystery, that two people no longer are two, but they literally come together as one, and that mystery is a true miracle, and we should guard that miracle. We should protect that miracle. We should cherish that miracle. You should look at your spouse, not as the enemy or an opposition, but you should look at your spouse as a real miracle. Johannes and I were just laughing this morning. He was telling a bunch of crazy jokes, and he reminded me of one that I've never told at church because it's probably just a little bit too risky on a Sunday morning, but I'll tell it to you, okay? So one day, the church is gathered together in a meeting quite like this, and the devil all of a sudden appears to them, pitched fork, red tail, and all. And everybody screams and runs to the doors except one man. He's just sitting there cold as ice. The devil says, why don't you run? Aren't you afraid of me? He said, why would I be afraid of you? I've been married to your sister for 40 years. Do you follow what I'm saying? Like, that's not the way that we look at our marriage. That's not the way that we look at our spouse. That's not the way that we want to view. We don't want to look and focus on the weakness or the flaw that's in one another. We want to look and focus on the strength. Any weakness that the other has, it's your opportunity to help strengthen and fortify that. And that's what we're going to really be talking about today. But this is an illustration, it says, of the way that Christ and the church are one. So he's telling us that this is the artwork, the illustration, the the manifestation of what is to come, of how Christ and the church are actually one. So that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. So Ephesians 5.33, it goes on to say this. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. I'm not going to go into a deep teaching on this. This is something I've done in previous marriage conferences. You guys can get those online on, on our website. But this is huge. Do you know that it is, it is absolutely scientifically proven today that a, a wife operates the best in her home? She is at the absolute highest level of who she is when she feels love from her husband. And a husband is actually the strongest, the best, the most centered, the most balanced that he could possibly be when he receives respect from his wife. So there's three things that we talk about that are critical in every marriage. There's two primal needs, and then there's a primal instinct. And all of them begin with the letter S. The primal need for the man is to feel significant, a.k.a. to feel respected. The primal need for the wife is to feel, listen, secure the very fabric of our marriage. And the survival part, God has made super clear. If there's abuse, there's three A's, abuse, abandonment, or adultery within the marriage, it threatens the very survival of the other one. And that is super, super hard to get past 
but it can be. We've got miracles in this room today that have walked through those three things or one of those three things, and God has worked a miracle in their marriage, and their marriage is better than they could have ever imagined. So it doesn't mean it's the end, but it's the only things that God condones divorce over. And then these two primal needs, the significance and the, the security or the love and the respect, if you come to me and say, we need help in our marriage, I can guarantee you a few things. I can guarantee you, one, you're not, you're not praying together regularly. Two, you're not reading the word of God together regularly. And three, one of these three S's has been violated. Either somebody's been disrespected, somebody's not feeling loved, or somebody is feeling their very survival is under attack. So God has given us this amazing plan, and I know that it's a lot easier said than done, but he's at least given us the blueprint so that we can have something to hold on to and base our life off of. So for men, it means that your absolute number one priority in your marriage is to make sure that your wife knows that she knows that you love her. She should never have to doubt that. And listen, it's not just by actions. It should be by words. I know you're a tough guy and you don't like to say it, but get over it. Say it. it, it it's, it's important to let your wife know repeatedly how much that you love her. And for wives, it's so critical for you to make sure that your husband is respected. And if you can do those two things, if, if wives can, and you think about even right now, don't, don't, don't get in an argument or start elbowing each other, but if you think about right now, when's the last time you've gotten an argument, and if you could trace it down to the root, I promise you 99.999% of every single one of them is going to boil down to one of these things being threatened. Either the significance or the respect has been threatened or the love has been threatened or even that survival. So when we're working, and this is the beautiful thing about it, when this is united marriage conference, talking about coming into true and full unity, when we're working together and we're working at our marriage together, that's when our marriage is going to be the strongest. And that's what I want to talk to you about is that we are so much better together. You might be awesome on your own, but I promise you, you are better together with the one that God has joined you with. Ecclesiastes 4.12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two, can you spin that way, baby? Does that spin? Look at that. Like a little carousel, like a little delicious, scrumptious carousel. But two, standing, we're sitting, but you get the point, standing back to back, right? If we stand back to back, this is what the military says, I got your six. And it means that I've got your back. If you could stand back to back, then look what it says, you can conquer. You could do so much. But then it goes on to say, but three are even better. A triple braided cord is not easily broken. Now, I'm not talking about no French stuff up in here. I want to be super clear. You follow what I'm saying? You ain't introducing nothing new to your marriage like that. I told oh you. Oh, my gosh. You just caught I it. I thought you were, no, wait. Yeah. I no, thought don't say you it. were talking about braiding our hair. <laughs> what? What does braiding armpit hair have? You said like a three-chord strand, and then I was just thinking of, okay. No, I'm, talk I, I'm talking about what I'm the French like to do. To it's called menage a trois. Wait until right? it's my yeah. turn. Yeah, yeah please. Know. Thank you. <laughs> I love you. I call those Melissa moments. I'm so glad you got to share in one of those. I get those every day, and I love them. And she always says, don't tell anybody I asked that. She asked some awesome questions. Okay. <laughs> Listen to what I'm telling you now. This is what I was telling you last night. Before Jesus, our marriage was really messed up. And it wasn't, it wasn't like messed up on the outside. It was messed up on the inside. But then Jesus came into our marriage. We asked him into our marriage after I gave my life to the Lord. We wanted him to be the center so you guys standing together, you can conquer. 
But if you will put Jesus at the very center of your marriage, if you will make God the focal point of your marriage, it cannot easily be broken under any circumstance. Let me go to this, and then we're going to wrap up my part. Melissa can go to hers. Learn from, lean on, and love one another. Work together. Look at it says in Ephesians 5, 21, and further... You want to take it further? You want to see your marriage get better? You want to go beyond where you're at? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We talked about what that word submit means last night, that it means to place your authority under the authority of another. How does that work? How does that look? How can you submit one to another? It, it means you're working as a team. If you look at an NFL football team, Everybody plays their part, and every part is absolutely crucial. Whether it's the left tackle protecting the blind side from the quarterback, whether it's the quarterback being able to throw the ball precision and accuracy to the wide receiver, the wide receiver being able to catch it and make his moves to get a touchdown. But in the end, they're working together. They're submitting one to other. They're submitting their gifts, their talents, and they're relying. That receiver needs the quarterback to throw the football. The quarterback needs that offensive line to block. And that offensive line needs Texas food to fuel those massive bodies, right? But in the end, they all need each other to make it work. And if, if they're not really, if they're arrogant, and we've seen some of those in football especially, but in life in general, where they're so cocky and arrogant, they don't need nobody else because they're so talented, they're so gifted, they're so smart. But really, in the end, they end up being nothing. Michael Jordan once said this. He said, I can walk on the, on the courts of inner city New York City basketball courts any given Sunday and find five people that are more talented than me. But not one of them will outwork me. Out, that not one of them will, I, will be a better teammate than I will be. Like, in the end... If we're working together, submitting together, and this is what it looks like for us, because the scripture goes on to say, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So you may try having a a hard time trying to submit to your husband, but you're really not submitting to him, you're submitting to the Lord. And look what it goes on to say, for a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, Christ is of the church. As the church submits to Christ, so wives must submit to your husbands in everything. So if it says just submit to one another, but then it goes on to clarify what that role looks like for each one of us. And that wives, you're not giving this up just to give it up, but you're giving it up to the Lord. And then it says for husbands, this means you must love your wives just as Christ loves the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy, clean, washed by the cleansing of God's Word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. She will be holy and without fault. So here it comes. If you want a practical way to work your marriage out and to work your problems out, wives, treat your husband like you treat Jesus. And husbands, treat your wives like Jesus treats the church. You want forgiveness, you want mercy, you want God to be a God of second chances, then be a husband that's not a hardliner, that doesn't demand perfection, that isn't always on your wife about this, that, or the other. Wives, the same. Don't nag your husbands to death. The scripture says it's better to eat a crumb of bread in the corner of the attic than feast with the filet mignon, baby. I just bought Johannes and Maria. I'm cooking up for him this afternoon. A Texas tomahawk steak. You ever see those? Things? Ooh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's better to eat a crumb of bread in the corner of the attic than to eat a Texas tomahawk steak in the midst of an nagging wife. So all that said, we've got to learn to work with one another. Verse 28, in the same way you husbands ought to love your wives as you love yourself. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his body and then feeds it and cares for it. Just as Christ cares for the church, we are the members of his body, so should we care for one another. 
So I want to encourage you today with this. This is a team, and it's going to take a team effort. For Melissa and I, this is how we work. We submit one to another out of reverence for Christ in everything. But if we've walked through that whole process and there's a decision that needs to be made and we're at odds with one another, what I'll always do is I'll pause and I'll pray. And I'll make sure that I know that this is what God is wanting me to speak and this is what God is wanting me to do. And then I'll say, honey, I've listened to everything you have to say, but I know in my heart and I've prayed about this that this is the way that God is calling us to go. And Melissa will always say two things. Number one, I hope you're right. Number two, she'll say, but I back you 100%. And I take that with a lot of weight. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be the macho guy that says, we're going to do it my way, and then be that idiot that ends up screwing it all up. I want to make sure that I'm leading with the grace of God, with the spirit of God. But when that When that final decision comes down to it, then I'm going to make that decision. If I feel like I've heard from God, but then there's times where Melissa just says, honey, I've got a word from God. I know that this is what we're supposed to do. And when she has that, if I feel peace about it, then it's done. And that's, I'm giving you a very short version, but that is what our marriage looks like. And what we have interpreted this scripture to mean is that we are working together on everything. But if there comes a time where one of us or both of us just can't get on the same page, then it's up to me to make the final call, whether I'm going to trust her decision or whether I'm going to roll with the ones. Does that make any sense? Awesome. Melissa? First, I want to say have grace on me. I'm not a professional speaker, as I always say, but I don't always as well flow as well as a professional speaker. So as long as you get the main points that I'm trying to say, Forget the fact whether or not I was well enough at flowing. Just get. You are no help to me when you do this. Um, God had given me this, and then I had went off of this simple statement to the things that I'm going to say. But he had showed me to view marriage as a novel where you do your best to read the entire novel through or watch the entire movie through. A novel or a movie, it usually starts out good, and in the middle, there's many things that are hard to watch, hard to read, hard to get through. You almost feel like putting the book down at times. You almost feel like not watching the movie. And then when you see it to the end, in America, we get our happy endings in the movies. Um, So I just want to say that. Um, Sorry. I'm going to get my notes right. Sometimes we may not like the way that the the book is being wrote or written. And that we can change. We are the author of our own book. God is the main author. We know how the main book goes, which is what we actually should be following off of anyways. We make allowances for other people's mistakes, other people's faults. Christopher and I did meet at 14. We do have a unique relationship, dated at 17, engaged at 17, married at 17, a child at 18. Um, Come on, somebody. I was working in. I... I do want to say this, too. Remember, might not flow. Just stay on focus what I'm saying. Um, Be always careful what we threaten. Christopher told the story last night, and I will change you on this one. You said spider monkey, and I will say spider woman. Is there a spider woman? I will say cat woman. Okay. So, yes, I did crawl on the, what is it? Spider Gwen. Oh, Spider-Gwen. Okay, I like that. Um, Yes, I did crawl on the wall and, you know, push him back and whatever. And often the things that we would walk away from a marriage on are biblical ways we can. Abuse, adultery, abandonment. I believe that even in those situations, there is often a root to those issues. And I don't tolerate Christopher does not tolerate believe in any of those abuse especially 
but I still do believe even in those hard situations that they can be worked through the root can be found out a woman can never be touched again and believe it or not it works both way there's a stigma put i believe that men only do these things christopher i would say you watched your sister beat the crap out of her first husband my sister bad to the bone she i was, mean you're a tough girl seriously so i think we have this stigma that it is just men that do these things in no, that's not the case whatsoever. I statistics on adultery, are, I believe, are pretty much co hand in hand. And in that, I will address this part because I do believe that women and men, but women should be very cautious of the way that we dress. If it's my husband, I don't want your. Can we be adults? Yes. I don't want your cleavage in my husband's face. And I don't think any wife wants the, no, no, yeah. Yeah, 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 that either, you know, <laughs> that she doesn't. And, you know, I don't think uh, people should take accountability, yes. But do I believe that circumstances can happen and seduction can happen, things like that. I do believe in all that, but I do believe in taking responsibility for what you should take responsibility for, and I'll leave that part at that. Um, but back to the part of this. I do believe, and I will hit on this heavy, I do believe that the end of the novel can always be that it can work out. You can get it right. Yeah. And... God can do it. He can make it work. You have to take the process to see it through. And if you have true repentance, then God has grace, and he has all the grace in the world, and he can make such a beautiful marriage. And I'll throw this into, it's not in my notes, but intimacy, sex, huge part of marriage. I apologize, Christopher, not in my notes, but <laughs> hey, maybe you helped it's me put my boots on this morning. Was, you're joking, but I don't know. I don't forget it. No, I had my jeans on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Missy moments. Ah! Um, I still got it. I, I do want to say this too, which is addresses to Christopher speaking last night. Be very careful what you say. Never use divorce unless you mean it. Be ready to back what you mean. Have your bags packed at that front door. Because the day that I said I was leaving Christopher and we separated for that brief time, I expected begging. I expected, no, honey, you're not going anywhere. It was like, if that's what you feel like you need to do, go ahead. And I was like, huh? <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I couldn't drive 45 miles on a two-way lane highway at the time. I was 21. I had never been on an airplane, and be darn, I was taking my car with me, the only one we had, because I bought it when I was 17. <laughs> so I was taking it at 2021. 20, but he was not in the right frame of mind, which shows that he was just focused on, he was not saved. He was focused on himself at the time. And he was willing for me to take his two-year-old child, Washington, D.C., six-lane highways. He called his brother, and Jimmy said, bro, do not let her go. This is why I love Jimmy, why I consider him my brother. <laughs> the, I love him for many reasons, but this is why I always say I love you. He said, don't let her go anywhere. I am getting in a car in five minutes. I will be there in seven hours. I will bring somebody with me. I will drive her back with your daughter because you are not thinking straight. He's so protective of us. It's not even like him. And Jimmy came down. We left. I was in the state of shock listening to and singing Fleetwood Mac. Jim had to hear it seven hours straight over and over Big, big love and all this other stuff, whatever we were singing. But either way, it was months. And still, I was kind of the one to initiate even still getting back together, realizing, no, I did want my marriage. And I, in a sense, could have walked away. 
but I finished the rest, still finishing, halfway through, but finishing the rest of the book because of decisions made. We could have let it go. I don't think you would have been pursuing me much, and who knows how things could have went, and it yeah, doesn't that's matter. that's kind of like the typical way things work. Like, I came home, she had her bags packed, and she told me she's leaving, and I was like, all right. And she's and it's a 12-hour drive. We're in North Carolina. It's a 12-hour drive back to Youngstown, Ohio, she said. And my brother drove seven hours down to get her, 12 hours to Youngstown to drop her off, and then had to drive five hours back to where he, where he lived and had somebody follow him to do all that. And I was just so, so stupid in my head and, not, and just so really lost in, in my own self that I was just going to let her, before he volunteered to do that, to, to take Candace and take this drive. And like she said, she didn't really expect me to say, okay. She wanted me to fight for it, and I was just not in a position in my heart to fight for it. But then in turn, when she left, I was miserable. I went like into a deep depression. I thought, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done. Why did I let her walk out of the door? I love her and I want to be with her. But now her pride's wounded because she didn't expect me to be okay with her leaving. My pride's wounded because she actually left. And now I'm mad at her. She's mad at me. And both of us got our butts hurt. And we don't want to say that to each other. And so then we just start acting tough with one another. Yeah, hey, how's Candace? She's fine. What do you want? Well, I'll just call to check on her. That's it. Okay, bye. <laughs> Click. Or I would play games where you would call like six, seven in the morning, and I'd be like, Melinda, that's my sister. I'm not here. I'm not here. I'm not here. So he would think I was out all night, which I was saved. I was just home taking care of yeah. my child, our child. And, and, and then she wanted to tell me that, that Melinda's boyfriend's cousin, sister's brother's baby's guy wants to take her out on a date. I was like, I'll kill everybody. Just understand that. There ain't no dating. We're married. And she's like, oh, we still are married? Yeah, we're freaking married. I'm trying to test me. I was so angry. But it's just so crazy. Like, why are we doing this? And you're young and you're dumb, you know? And then we get older, and if we aren't careful, we stay in those patterns, we stay in those ruts, and we keep doing it. And that's where we decided, let's never say that word again. Let's never use that word against each other again. We, we, we believe we're going to be together till the day that Jesus brings us home. Then let's never, ever, we're in this in every area and every facet. I just want to also add, never let condemnation kick you, kick you when you're down or not even down, but just never let it kick you. If you're on your second marriage and it ended because of those reasons, and you're on your second marriage, make the second one work right with this system then, the Bible. It didn't work, and you're on your second. It is what it is, and just let God do what he does. Um, a good piece of advice, a very, very good piece of advice, and I'm not talking about abuse. Uh, that's never something I believe that you hide. And I'm not necessarily talking about adultery or abandonment if you need someone to talk to. Be very careful not to be, I'll say it how I wrote it. I was going to try to think of better wording. Don't be a blabbermouth. Do not tell everybody, not even including necessarily your family, because what can often happen is you'll forgive the spouse but you'll wound your family, and they will never be able to stand them again. It's just a good piece of advice. Never feel like you have to go to 15 people to give you really, in the end, what you're looking for because you want to hear yeah. what you want to hear. So just a very let, good let, piece let me of add advice. To that and tell you, never go, don't take this the wrong way. I just don't know how else it's better said. Never go for advice across or down the, the road, you know. Don't go to somebody for marital advice that has a more messed up marriage than you do. You know, don't, 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 all you're doing, Melissa said it, you're just looking for somebody to tell you what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear. You always go up. You always go to parents. You go to pastors. You go to counselors. You always go up to get wisdom and advice because you go to somebody that you know that's been doing it longer than you've been doing it and doing it better than you've been doing it because in the end, 
We, we, we all do it. We all ask. She said it best. You ask 15 people until you finally get somebody to tell you what you wanted to hear so that you could feel justified about the bad decisions you're about to make. And sometimes you just need, you, always, you need somebody to truly tell you what you need to hear. This is not in my notes, but I do want to add this to submission as pastor said last night, is something that we have an option to do. We can either submit. It's our choice. We don't have to if we don't want to. But if your husband treats you with such respect, get your opinion. If you have a problem in the end with him having the final say and he does it biblically right, then you have yourself to look at, number one. And number two, women, if you have a problem with even hearing the word submission, 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 <laughs> you have a problem with submission. Um, always treat your spouse like a king or a queen. I think if you just did that, talk through everything, learn their love language, do the best that you can, things will be so much better. Communication. Always be truthful no matter how hard it is. God can work everything through. Did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Henry? I just want to say that's kind of like Melissa and I's code words, you know. Um, and I've told this story, but I, it's, it's a good one to tell again. We were at War Harvest under Pastor Parsley. He was the largest church in America at the time. And, you know, he's just a really awesome man of God, very anointed. And she had so much respect for him immediately. And she would treat him like he was literally the greatest human being on the planet. And this is after Jesus, after, you know, uh, salvation on, uh, on both of our ends. And after a while, and then I'd come home, and then, you know, she would just come at me like, you know, like Spider Gwen, right? And so finally one day I said, I need to ask you a question. She, she said, what is it? I said, why do you respect Pastor Parsley more than you respect your own husband? She goes, I don't. I, I, res I mean, I respect him a lot, but I respect you more. I said, well, you don't treat me like you do. You treat him like he's a, a, a king, and you treat me at times like I'm the joker. Like, and, and that was probably, I would honestly say, in all of our marriage, it's the only one time I ever had something on Melissa. Like, it's the only one time I was like, I got this. Like, man, that was good. That had to be the Holy Spirit. I couldn't think of that on my own. And she literally stopped, and I watched the countenance of her face change in a good way, and she said, you're 100% right. I'll never do that again. And I can tell you, she never has. And that was back in 2001. So for the last 17 years, of the 25 years of our marriage, we've used that, that she is going to treat me like a king, and I'm going to treat her like a queen. If you got the chance to go meet a president or the first lady or a king or a queen of a nation, you think about how you would treat them, and why would you treat them better than you treat the one that God has joined you together with in a miraculous way? And here's why. Because when you get familiar, the word familiar, the, the, one of the root meanings of the word familiar is, is, to, is to lack caution. Like you get so familiar with somebody that you end up not, you take it for granted, and, and you don't realize how much you do, and yet it's the one you should never take for granted. It's the one that you should treat like the miracle all the way. We got a minute and 30 seconds. You got anything else you want to add? Yeah, because it's not my notes, so I know it's the Holy Spirit, so I'm just going to do it real quick. Um, the last thing that I want to say, second to the last, is that when we take vows, I've even had my husband been given this advice by friends. It breaks my heart to hear. It breaks my heart for him. I hate sympathy for me. I hate my healing talked about. I'm just waiting on it. It's the end of my book. Come on. So for people to say that he should not stay with me because, or they couldn't do it because... I need healed. Well, you don't maybe look like me. You don't walk like me. You don't talk like me. You don't love like me. Or you didn't take your vows like I did. Whatever it is, I know I got passionate because it is a sensitive spot. But for me, I don't like sympathy over it. 
I feel more bad for Christopher, but I don't think he wants sympathy over it either. It's just a part of our book that will end the way that it should end. And the last thing that I will say, because just like the marriage conference, whatever women were here and that prophetic word I had that I said my knees were buckling that night, there were four, four women. There is some couple in this room tonight, for sure, 100%. You spoke about it even last night when you went to bed or this morning. This is it for you. This conference in your mind, is it for you? No, it is not. This is just the beginning. So you're going to get it. Your marriage will work. Whatever those three A's are, get to the root, work through it, because God's grace is ready. So you don't know this. That's so good. You don't know this. Yeah. Somebody walked in the door last night. I didn't even tell you this. Somebody walked in the door last night and told me. They walked in. They looked like they were angry at each other already. They've been fighting on the way here. And I said, it's so good to see you. And they said, they just let me know, this is it for us. If, 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 we, if we can't make it after this, we're done. Like, this is it. This is our last chance at our marriage. So We I, really do not communicate about stuff like this. Like, yeah, I just don't we talk, don't talk about, talk about ministry home. Yeah. at home. But that's something that I believe this has been, these conferences have been so helpful. We've got so many testimonies throughout Reach Church as a whole. That these conferences, they're not the fix-all. What they're meant to be is the catalyst to get you heading in the right direction. They're, they're the spark to get that flame back burning. Amen? So I'm going to pray over that, and then we're going to take a quick 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back together for session two. Father, I thank you for your word today going forth in the hearts and the minds of each and every one. I pray today, Lord, that that spark, that that flame would be fanned into an inferno, Lord. We pray together, Melissa and I both, Father, over every marriage, but especially those that are on the rocks. We pray that they would be put on the rock, that they would be based on you and you alone, that anybody that's in that ultimatum stage, Lord, that you would give them that hope, that inspiration, that encouragement to keep moving forward. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen.